Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker today. Uh, Lindley Gwynapp is our founder and principal analyst at the Lindley Group. Lindley is editor-in-chief of Microprocessor Report and author of uh, many recent articles on uh, AI and processors. Um, he's also co-author of our guide to processors for deep learning. We just recently published our uh, fourth edition of this comprehensive guide to AI chips. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Lindley. Lindley? Good, thanks. Um, good morning, everyone. And I am Lindley Gwenap, as Bob said. Um, I'll be uh, uh, talking about uh, driving AI. So uh, my talk uh, the, uh, today, I'll uh, be uh, starting uh, with some general background on application-specific accelerators. Uh, diving into some uh, more recent trends that we're seeing in AI acceleration, uh, and then uh, spend some time uh, talking specifically about the data center uh, and then the edge and, uh, and wrap up. So let's get started. Um, so, uh, you know, we've seen this emergence over the past several years of AI accelerators uh, as, as a different class of uh, device than general purpose processors. Um, you know, initially a lot of the AI was done on CPUs, uh, GPUs, and DSPs uh, that use a, a SIMD style architecture to parallelize and enhance the computation throughput, um, and which uh, is, of course, much better than just executing the operations one at a time. But we see uh, that there is a bottleneck in that you know, each instruction has to be decoded to uh, create a, a set of SIMD operations. So one of the, the things that we've seen in AI accelerators as a differentiator is the use of systolic arrays. Uh, so you can see that uh, this is an array of, of MAC units uh, to handle the multiply accumulate operation. Uh, the data moves uh, uh, autonomously, automatically from one MAC unit to the next. Um, the results uh, flow down. And uh, this is a much more efficient structure uh, than a SIMD architecture to uh, accomplish a set of uh, multiply accumulates that we typically see in an AI um, model. So, uh, so this is uh, one of the differentiating factors. But uh, moving even beyond the, the systolic array, we've uh, seen uh, some vendors using a slightly different approach called a convolution architecture. Since most of the AI models um, uh, perform these convolutions in which uh, a kernel that would be say uh, three by three uh, matrix would be multiplied against a larger matrix of data. Um, the hardware is actually being optimized in this case to perform this three by three matrix multiply operation. Uh, so you see the, the, the multiplies, uh, the, the add or adder units which uh, accumulate all the results and um, perform this uh, all in one take. So, um, you know, this convolution architecture is, is even more optimized for these kind of convolution operations. Uh, it's optimized for the memory uh, requirements as well. And, you know, it's, but it's not as flexible for some of the, the newer or different uh, architectures that aren't as heavily convolution based. There's also a, um, kind of uh, spectrum here of, uh, op of options uh, from uh, big cores to little cores. And so we've seen a lot of different vendors choose places along this, this spectrum. Um, you know, the, at one extreme, we see um, these very small cores, uh, which are very easy to design. They're simple. You just replicate a lot of these cores to, to form a large chip. Um, it's a very scalable approach. Um, and, uh, you know, we've seen, you know, some uh, architectures use uh, up to, you know, thousands of these cores uh, to create, you know, very large chips. Uh, in fact, you know, we'll be hearing uh, at, at the conference uh, from uh, Cerebris who has, you know, hundreds of thousands of cores, you know, on, on their chips. So, um, you know, that, that's certainly, you know, one extreme, or you can make the cores, you know, bigger, more complicated, have more power per core, and um, you know, this, this has its advantages as well. Um, yeah, the interconnect is simpler because you don't have so many cores. Um, but perhaps more importantly, 
uh, the software becomes simpler because you don't have to divide the model into as many uh, tiny pieces to spread out over all these cores. Um, and finally, what we've seen is that uh, the, the, the bigger core approach, um, which, which results, of course, in fewer cores on the chip, is better for latency sensitive operations. In fact, uh, Grok, which has just a single massive core on their chip, uh, has the best latency that we've seen on, on Resonant 50. So, um, so there's a trade off here, depending on what kind of applications you want to go after and what you know, optimizations you feel are important for your design. So on um, another, another uh, uh, approach is, um, is the data flow approach. So typically, you know, most of the, the, the accelerators we're seeing are using a multi-core approach. And you just kind of put all these cores on the chip in parallel. Each one processes uh, a, one copy of the neural network from start to finish. Uh, this makes it really easy for the software. You just add more copies of the, of the, of the model as you increase the core count. But um, it, it does create some inefficiencies because each core has to have uh, access to the entire network. And uh, you know, so it has to have enough memory uh, or be able to access enough memory um, uh, in order to execute the network. Um, what we've seen some companies do is this data flow design in which you have uh, a lot of cores and each core just does a, a part of the network. And so that core has to just have enough memory to hold its own uh, uh, piece of the instructions, uh, its own set of, of the weights, and then the data naturally flows across uh, the chip um, in order to execute the different layers in the network and ultimately to complete the network. Um, now this does uh, complicate the software because uh, again, the compiler has to divide up the network and it has to figure out where to put the different pieces on the chip in order to kind of optimize the data flow across the chip. Um, but if you can do that, you can see that there's efficiencies you know, in the hardware by, by creating this, this data flow across the chip. And then uh, kind of taking this data flow approach to the extreme, uh, there's a, a, a newer technique called coarse grain reconfigurable architecture, CGRA, uh, which, which some companies have been using. And instead of having programmable cores, you know, you just have, you know, these blocks of compute and memory on the chip. And you use the same kind of data flow principle, but you pre-configured each of these uh, compute units to execute a specific task. And so they don't have to go through all the overhead of, of loading and decoding instructions. Um, so, so the blocks are much simpler and um, you, know, you can get more compute onto the chip. Um, now, again, the compiler becomes you know, complex because it has to uh, figure out how to map each network onto this array as efficiently as possible. Um, but uh, you know, we've seen some promising results from companies like Sambanova uh, using the CGRA architecture. And um, I think we'll see you know, more companies um, experimenting with this in the future, which, which kind of creates another um, uh, a spectrum uh, of, of uh, different approaches. Um, and and this, this is not just for AI accelerators, of course, but this is something that, that uh, processor designers have been aware of for, for uh, decades. Um, you, know, you, you can build very general purpose processors that can execute you know, any kind of code that you want, but the performance may not be fully optimized. But as you uh, build more and more specialized logic into a processor design, then you can achieve higher and higher performance on that particular task. But then the processor becomes more specialized and it's not very good at other tasks. So um, you know, as, as, as we apply this uh, to AI accelerators, uh, you can see uh, you, you can move from, from a, a general purpose CPU to say a GPU that has some uh, uh, optimized uh, SIMD units to uh, a chip that has uh, systolic arrays um, built in, or um, you can get even more specialized with these convolution units um, that, that apply to a particular kind of neural network. So the, the further down you go, um, you, know, you can see the benefits and optimizations, um, but because the AI uh, 
industry is moving so quickly and different kinds of models are being uh, created all the time, getting too specialized you know, may not be the best choice because uh, somebody may want to run a different model that doesn't work well on your very specialized architecture. So, uh, so I want to transition now into some trends that we're seeing. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, the, the, uh, the industry is, is evolving uh, uh, very quickly and uh, we're seeing the kinds of models and the size of the models uh, changing um, over the last few years. Um, and part of the reason is because as the neural networks become larger, they become more complicated, they, they produce more accurate results and they're able to solve bigger problems. So, uh, so there's definitely an impetus to, to make these models larger. Um, you know, for these imaging models that I'm showing here, um, you know, with ResNet, uh, you know, coming out in 2014, and then we've seen uh, successive uh, uh, iterations of different kinds of imaging models, we kind of gotten to the point where, you know, image recognition is, 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 is a pretty well solved problem. And um, what, what we are seeing, though, is that um, a lot of uh, customers want to increase the size of the image. The, the original ResNet is only designed to do, you know, 224 by 224 pixel images. Um, but, um, you know, now, uh, particularly in the automotive industry, um, we, we want to build cars that have cameras uh, that have, you know, high definition cameras, 4K cameras, uh, the higher the resolution, the more you can see, the further ahead you can look. So um, these models become uh, much bigger as, as they have to process more pixels. So, uh, so you need more memory, you need more parameters, and you need more compute in order to, to handle um, these larger images. In fact, uh, uh, going from, from the original resident up to just an HD image would be 40 times more compute or going to 4K 160 times more compute. So, uh, so that does really pressure um, the, the AI accelerator to handle that level of, of computation and the amount of memory that's required for uh, storing all of those parameters. But the, the biggest growth that we've seen, uh, just explosive growth over the last few years has been in these natural language processing models. So, you know, these models are trying to handle more challenging tasks than image recognition, um, you know, trying to translate, um, you know, from one language uh, to another, you know, English to German, uh, Chinese to English, um, trying to uh, analyze written documents, trying to create, uh, you know, written text. Um, uh, these, these are tremendously difficult tasks. And so in order to do them and do them well, um, the, the researchers have been uh, increasing the size of the model. As we can see, um, you know, we're into billions of parameters. And in fact, um, you know, just recently, uh, Google announced the, the, the switch model, which has over a trillion parameters uh, that they're using in order to, to solve some of these tasks. Um, so, um, and, and the, the uh, uh, size of these models just keeps growing exponentially and uh, there's no, no sign that it's going to stop. Um, I think the limit, the only limit is of course the compute power that can be poured into training and executing these models. Uh, another application for large models is uh, what's called recommender models. So, you know, for example, if you go on to um, Amazon uh, to buy something, it will recommend, you know, different products that, that you might be interested in. Uh, if you go on Facebook, it would recommend, uh, you know, another article that you would be interested in or, or an ad that might be interesting. And so, um, you know, these models can also have billions and billions of parameters and, uh, and be a big uh, challenge to train and execute. So, um, so uh, this, desire to have these larger, more powerful, more accurate models is, is really driving uh, the AI industry to deliver more powerful and more scalable chips. So, you know, what does it take to, you know, actually inference these large models? Well, you need a lot of memory because you have to store the parameters on the chip. If it doesn't fit on the chip, now you're, you're constantly fetching parameters um, from uh, off, off chip memory, which is going to slow things down. Um, so, uh, you know, we're seeing uh, chips now that have hundreds of megabytes of, of SRAM on the chip. 
but you know even that's not anywhere close to enough for these big models. So you need uh, you know gigabytes and gigabytes, preferably of high bandwidth memory, um, you know to to run you know these these very large models, and you know because you can't fit these very large models on a single chip. Now you want to divide the model across multiple chips. So uh, as you can see here, um, you could take a, a set of chips um, and pipeline them. And so the first chip would execute, say, the first couple of layers. The next chip would execute the next couple of layers, and you know, so on and so forth. And then uh, each chip would only have to store enough uh, parameters for the, the actual layers that it's executing. So you know, this is a technique that can be used to fairly uh, easily uh, divide a model up across several chips and, uh, and then be able to, to process larger models more efficiently. Now, in order to uh, do this kind of pipelining, um, it's convenient to have a memory coherent interconnect so that uh, from the software point of view, all of these chips are working in the same memory space. The data can flow through the system um, uh, within the same memory space. And uh, so that uh, simplifies the software. Um, so we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, chips now that, that target these larger models implementing you know, some kind of high speed coherent interconnect. Uh, of course, NVIDIA has uh, NVLink, but uh, most other companies have you know, had, uh, they're created their own uh, sort of uh, link to, to simulate the same effect. Now, in order to train these large models, of course, you need you need similar uh, problems. But um, but uh, as the models get bigger and bigger, now um, you have to execute this very large uh, set of training data. Um, so one thing you can do is uh, divide the training set uh, among many chips. So so uh, you know typically you're training on you know millions or billions of, of uh, sample data um, items. And so now you just divide each of those among you know, hundreds or thousands of chips. And now you have this data parallelism um, that allows you to more quickly train the model. So um, you know, on, on the training side, you can usually use these large batches of models or large batches of data uh, at a time. Uh, and that uh, can scale well across uh, all of these different chips. But you still run into these the the memory limit, you know, for these large models. So you can't run a large model on one chip uh, with data parallelism. Um, so then, you know, to go beyond this pipelining techniques for even larger models, um, you know, this, this uh, you can get into this more general model sharding, um, you know, which which you know goes beyond just you know cutting the 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 different layers apart and and actually having to go into each layer and uh, you know, pick out bits and pieces that can be uh, spread across multiple chips. So, um, you know, model sharding, you know, particularly at the, at the largest models, uh, you know, is, is, a, is a complex task. Um, it often requires some kind of manual uh, assistance um, to, uh, to be able to help the software find um, the optimal division. Um, because, of course, uh, you want to balance uh, the amount of work on, on each chip as much as possible. And so, you know, as you uh, use the data parallelism and the model parallelism, and you're creating enough work for, you know, hundreds or thousands of chips, um, now you have to physically connect those and figure out how to scale across. Um, so you need, you know, these high bandwidth connections uh, between the, the chips in a rack. You need high bandwidth connections between racks. Um, so, um, and, and ideally, you know, from a software standpoint, these would be uh, memory coherent connections. Um, and, uh, but in some cases, you kind of have to live with uh, more of a standard ethernet or a, a rocky kind of connection um, uh, between the racks. So, um, so there's uh, different approaches. And, and I think the uh, AI accelerator vendors are starting to turn from, you know, just creating a chip that's as fast as possible to trying to uh, understand, you know, how to scale this chip up into, you know, these very large systems uh, because there's a lot of value there. So, um, you know, we'll be hearing uh, tomorrow uh, from you know, some of the vendors that that are talking about, you know, how how they are designing their chips and systems, you know, for for this kind of scalability. Um, 
Now, another way to improve performance is uh, looking at these data types. And, um, you know, we, we've kind of started, uh, you know, with AI doing everything in 32 bits. Um, then things uh, were kind of pushed down to 16 bits. And we said, okay, that was, that's working pretty well. Um, for an inference, uh, a lot of the inference work today is being done in 8-bit integers. Um, and, um, you know, we, we've seen good results there. Um, you know, 8-bit eight, eight integers, uh, you know, do require some, uh, you know, quantization and then, uh, you know, uh, with some rescaling and then there's often some retraining involved. But if you take the proper steps, uh, you can uh, achieve pretty much the same accuracy that you would, you know, with 32-bit data. What we've, uh, you know, seen more recently now is, is some work that's being done in order to go beyond uh, in eight down into in four um, or even in two. So IBM has published some papers uh, that show uh, uh, some more aggressive scaling techniques, dynamic scaling, the changes uh, uh, from layer to layer. Um, and, you know, with these uh, more advanced techniques, they're able to achieve uh, the same accuracy uh, from int eight down to int four, which is pretty impressive. And then even at, at using two bit integers, uh, the accuracy, you know, is, is within a percent or two. So, um, so there's, uh, there's some good work being done there. Uh, IBM has also been doing some work uh, and, and others, of course, uh, with um, eight bit floating point formats. And uh, IBM has come up with this uh, hybrid uh, format uh, for uh, the forward and backward passes. And as you can see from the graph here, uh, getting very good results, um, you know, from their hybrid, you know, floating point format. So, um, so we're definitely seeing, um, you know, some 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 good work done there. Um, you know, we're going to hear uh, later today from Deep AI, uh, which is uh, using a slightly different approach of eight bit integers uh, to do some training and retraining. And and the advantage here is, you know, the narrower uh, the data type that you use, the the, the better scaling factor you can get on the performance. Um, so, so there is a lot of advantage in, you know, moving to these smaller data types, you know, as long as the, uh, the accuracy holds up. Now, the ultimate in this uh, approach would be binary networks, um, you know, reducing the weight values to a single bit. Um, not only does this reduce the amount of compute uh, and reduce the amount of memory, um, but you can actually get rid of the, the multiply circuit entirely. I mean, when you just have one bit being multiplied by one bit, I mean, it's the logic gate um, that, uh, that, that performs the function. So, um, you know, so this, this, this is a great savings in, in compute. It's a great savings in power, of course. And then, you know, the, the downside, of course, is that the accuracy is lower. Um, you know, on, on, a, on something like AlexNet, which is a pretty simple uh, neural network, uh, you know, we're seeing a reduction from 80% accuracy to maybe 70% accuracy. Um, you know, so, so it's a pretty significant uh, delta. Now, you know, there are some approaches that are being used uh, to try to, to get back some of that accuracy. You know, how do you encode the weights in one bit? Um, how do you scale them? So um, again, you know, there's, there's some work being done here. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if you have an application where you know maybe you don't need all of the the uh, last bits of accuracy. Um, if uh, if you can if you can accept uh, uh, this this lower accuracy, uh, there's there's a tremendous uh, power savings available in binary neural networks, and so we are seeing you know some applications uh, for that uh, uh, technique, and then some chips that are being you know optimized you know for for these binary networks. Another technique that's being used uh, uh, more is uh, sparse computing. Um, so the idea here is that um, when, we, when we process a neural network, um, uh, a lot of the uh, weights end up being uh, zero or close to zero. A lot of the activation values end up being zero uh, because of, of the way the activation functions are processed. So um, if, if you uh, just look for these zeros, and you know that zero times anything is zero, you can just disable the multiply unit uh, for that cycle and, and save power. Um, so that, that's a good way uh, to save power, um, but it doesn't necessarily improve your performance. Uh, what we're seeing um, 
in in some chips and and um, you know I use the example here of Nvidia's uh, new Ampere architecture. Um, you they can re basically rearrange the computations uh, to skip these these zero values and and then you know use their compute units 100% of the time uh, for more valuable computations. Uh, what Nvidia does is they they look at all the weights in a particular group. They, they automatically suppress the two smallest ones in each group of four, and then they only do the computation on the other two. So, um, you know, so this automatically doubles the throughput of the chip um, when you turn this mode on. Now, I mean, you can, uh, you know, in this, in this case, suppress some weights that are not zero or even, uh, you know, might be, might be significant. So, so you'll see some accuracy reduction, but I mean, in many cases, the accuracy reduction is, is, is small or negligible. And, uh, and again, you get this, this 2x uh, improvement in performance and, and performance per watt. So, um, so I think, uh, you know, this is a good example of the value of, of handling sparsity in hardware. And, and again, we're seeing, you know, more uh, chip uh, designs that are trying to uh, take better advantage of the sparsity capability. Uh, a, a completely different approach is uh, spiking neural networks. Um, so, you know, most of the, the, the work that's being done is, is more on, on, on traditional convolutional neural no networks, um, but, uh, but using this kind of a neuromorphic approach is, is supposed to be, you know, more similar to what's going on in the brain. Basically, um, uh, that, uh, you know, some, uh, uh, an activity happens it creates this spike on the wire. And then, you know, when the, the neuron sees a spike, it then evaluates its inputs and then passes another spike downstream so that uh, there's really no power that's used unless uh, something happens. And then once, once the spike come in, then, then it, it does the work. So, so th this is a great approach, um, you know, for very low power applications where you want to save the power. Um, uh, it can also uh, handle uh, what's called unsupervised learning, which uh, you can just give it uh, a, a set of images or a set of data, and it, it can just kind of find the patterns on its own. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we've seen uh, several companies working in this area. Uh, we're going to be, uh, you know, hearing from uh, Inetera uh, later today, um, talking about their solution. Brainship is also. Uh, going to be speaking later this week. So then, you know, going beyond kind of the digital domain, uh, several companies are looking at analog computing uh, in order to reduce power. Um, so, um, you know, what, uh, what this uh, uh, diagram shows is an analog circuit that can actually uh, compute a series of multiply accumulate operations, uh, you know, just using the current um, and the, the resistance in, the, in these cells. Um, and, and so without any digital logic, multiply units or whatnot, um, you can reduce power by 10x, 20x or more uh, using the analog com computing. Um, you know, so there, there's some challenges here though. Um, you know, like any analog circuit, you can have variation uh, in the manufacturing process you know, which, which uh, is, is more difficult to account for and can cause errors, you know, in the analog result. Um, the other problem that you can see is that uh, even though the, the uh, Mac computation itself is very low power, um, you still need to convert the data from, you know, digital, say stored in a memory uh, and then do the compute and then transform it back from analog into digital. Um, and, uh, you know, that can, you know, burn up a lot of power um, as well. So, um, so we're seeing, uh, again, we're seeing a handful of companies uh, pursuing this approach. Um, you know, we'll be hearing um, from, from Mythic later this week. So, um, so this is a, a promising approach that, um, you know, could really uh, give us the next, you know, 10x in, in performance per watt that, uh, that we need to keep up with the, the growth in these, these large models. Um, and then another completely different uh, technology, which is uh, promising, is photonic computation. Um, instead of doing the MAC in, in analog here, what we're actually doing is uh, taking advantage of the properties of, of light transmission um, and, um, 
and using that uh, to uh, compute a, a Mac operation. Um, so uh, the advantage here is that it's uh, extremely fast. And, and once you fire up the laser, I mean, there's really no power in causing the light beams to cross. Um, so, so you can calculate a lot of uh, multiply operations, you know, by running, you know, single laser. So uh, again, I mean, you still have to figure out how to get the data from the digital domain into the photonic domain and back again. Um, which typically requires going through the analog domain. So now you've got uh, overhead in, in translating back and forth. Um, but, uh, but again, we're seeing some, some promising results. Um, a company called Light Matter uh, has a test chip that they're showing you know, up to 10x efficiency gain um, you know, versus a traditional GPU type architecture. Um, you know, other companies uh, are, are pursuing you know, this technology as well. So, um, you know, we see, uh, uh, again, uh, some, some significant issues to overcome, but, uh, you know, if a company can, can make this photonic computation work, it, it, could, uh, it could be a big leap forward. So um, a lot of different alternatives that are being tried um, to, uh, to the traditional uh, digital uh, computation. And, uh, you know, hopefully at least, you know, one of these new approaches is going to, to pan out. So I want to um, I want to uh, switch gears and 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 focus on uh, some specific uh, products and 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 topics in the data center. So uh, Nvidia, of course, is you know the the market leader here, and um, you know if anything, the company has been you know extending its 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 market lead um, in uh, in 2020. Um, you know its uh, data center revenue, which is basically uh, you know the AI is uh, is up 68% uh, last year, and that's excluding the uh, the the Mellanox acquisition. This is just their core AI revenue. So uh, so tremendous um, so tremendous growth going on. You know with Nvidia, and you know which which indicates that the industry as a whole is is growing very quickly. Um, uh, last year, uh, Nvidia introduced their Ampere uh, A100 architecture. Uh, with, with big improvements, um, you know, over, uh, over 2x improvements in performance. Plus, uh, on top of that, you get uh, the benefits of the sparsity technique I talked about, um, uh, big increase in the amount of on-chip memory to try to deal with these larger models. And, um, you know, but, but we are seeing very high power rating on their chips. So, um, you know, we're also seeing um, a transition from on the, on the inference side, um, a few years ago, uh, most of the inference was being done on CPUs, but now uh, today uh, we're seeing the, the NVIDIA, particularly with their T4 card uh, as, as the most popular uh, solution for AI inference in data centers. So, uh, so that's been uh, driving a lot of NVIDIA's growth as well. Um, so NVIDIA does have a lot of challengers that are going after uh, their, their big uh, growth. Um, so, the, um, so on the training side, you know, we're seeing companies uh, like Cerebris that um, is, um, is uh, offering you know, this, this very big uh, chip with, with over 400,000 cores and, and, and 18 gigabytes of memory. So, I mean, obviously this is a uh, solution aimed at, at training the largest models uh, that are out there. And, uh, and we'll be hearing um, you know, from them tomorrow. Um, GraphCore um, is, is competing in the training space as well. Uh, Intel uh, with their Habana acquisition, uh, Samba Nova, TensTorrent. Um, so there's, there's a lot of competition there. Um, you know, so far, you know, these companies e either uh, you know, have benchmarked uh, you know, comparable to the previous generation NVIDIA chip, the V100, you know, or they're, they haven't really disclosed much in the way of benchmarks. So, um, you know, so we haven't seen anybody on the training side, you know, really be able to, you know, keep pace, you know, with, with Ampere, uh, you know, much less uh, surpass it, but, um, but it is, um, but it is, uh, you know, still early in the game. You know, some of these companies, you know, uh, are planning to disclose some benchmarks soon. 
And, you know, it'll be interesting to see, you know, where, you know, the competition for NVIDIA is going to come from here. On the inference side, um, I think there's been a little bit more uh, of, a, of a, a challenge uh, to NVIDIA. Um, you know, the A100 posts, you know, very good inference scores, but it is a 400 watt chip. Um, you know, and what we're seeing is, is companies, you know, like Qualcomm uh, and Tenstorm offer uh, similar performance to the A100, um, but at, at 75 watt TDP. So, uh, so you get much better performance per watt, you know, from, from some of these uh, products, um, you know, the, that are new on the market. Um, the, the Qualcomm one isn't in production yet, um, but, you um, but I think that uh, you know the, these designs, you know, are showing you know strong promise of of delivering uh, you know much better performance uh, per watt than than Nvidia does. And uh, you know we'll be hearing from Qualcomm on Friday uh, more about their their exciting new chip. Um, and uh, and uh, then you know we're also seeing you know companies like Grok that you know are are as I mentioned earlier offering uh, uh, industry leading latency. Um, you know, so, so for these real-time workloads, I mean, that's a great, um, you know, that's a great uh, option, um, you know, and, uh, and, and, and Intel um, is competitive with, uh, with their Habana chip. Uh, and then a new company, Simple Machines, um, is uh, using uh, CGRA architecture and showing the flexibility, I mean, on ResNet, you know, it, it, it's very comp, um, comparable to some of the older NVIDIA chips, but it really excels on, uh, on NLP uh, benchmarks like BERT. So, um, so, uh, so we're keeping an eye on them as well. And, and Simple Machines, you know, will be presenting uh, this week uh, as well. Um, one of the trends uh, that we're seeing is that cloud vendors are actually designing their own AI chips, um, you know, because these companies develop their own AI models. Um, they're very familiar with what's, uh, what's going on inside their own models. Uh, you know, they feel like they can add, you know, some value by, by designing their own chips. So, um, so uh, Alibaba, for example, uh, Google, Amazon, Baidu, you know, uh, most of the leading cloud vendors uh, you know, the Super 7 guys uh, have developed their own chips. And, um, you know, Alibaba's chip is, is pretty impressive uh, on ResNet 50. We haven't seen, you know, other benchmarks. Um, Google um, is very competitive with NVIDIA um, on the ML Perf training benchmarks, uh, even with the, against the A100. Um, so, so Google is, is in, in pretty broad deployment of their chip. Um, you know, these other companies are not, you know, necessarily using their chips uh, very broadly internally. Uh, Amazon is uh, using theirs for, for one piece of the Alexa service. Um, but, um, but, you know, they, they are continuing their efforts and I think trying to create some at least internal competition for NVIDIA. And, um, you know, a lot of these companies that are, are trying to compete against NVIDIA are struggling with the software side. Um, you know, NVIDIA has a, a tremendous amount of software uh, built up on its, its CUDA platform. Um, uh, NVIDIA's chips are compatible with, um, you know, all of the leading frameworks and applications. So, you know, for other companies, um, there's just a, a tremendous amount of software that they need to, to build. And, um, you know, so, you know, in, in, in a lot of cases, you know, their chips are not compatible with certain frameworks, they're not compatible with certain models, and, you know, customers complain because their models don't compile. So, um, you know, ResNet is a very simple model, so, you know, that's why we see everyone benchmarking that, but, um, you know, if, um, if, if a company has a really solid software stack, you know, then we'll see, you know, benchmarks uh, on, on a broader range of models covering, you know, a lot of the different use cases that MLPerf includes, and you know that that's a good sign that you know companies have a really solid software stack when you know when they're publishing multiple benchmarks and and publishing ML perf numbers. Um, 
So then, um, you know, lastly, I wanted to uh, talk uh, more about the edge uh, of the network. So, um, you know, people use edge to mean a lot of different things. Um, you know, I, I kind of include, you know, anything in the in the client space uh, as well as uh, as well as the edge of the network. And we are seeing, you know, a lot of uh, AI work moving out of the cloud, um, you know, onto these edge devices. Um, you know, for several reasons. Um, the, you know, cloud servers are getting overloaded due to the popularity of, you know, some of these voice services, some of the translation services. And, um, you know, so uh, moving some of the work onto, you know, the client device, uh, you know, simplifies the data center load. Um, and um, the uh, moving this work onto the client device is also, um, good for uh, reducing latency and improving reliability because now your service still works if the network is down, if your network connection is down and, uh, and privacy as well. Um, you know, if you don't want to expose all of your uh, conversations, for example, to, uh, to the cloud. So, um, so we're seeing new devices like, um, you know, the latest Amazon Echo, uh, which um, has a built-in AI capability and you know is able to you know process voice commands locally. I uh, can even uh, do some some camera tracking. So um, so a lot of interesting things are going on in in device design um, that are that are driving you know AI into these client devices. So um, you know because of that you know we're needing you know new more powerful chips you know for these edge devices and we're seeing a lot of companies jump into this space. Uh, the barriers to entry are lower than for data center because, you know, the devices are, are simpler, the performance targets are lower, and you don't have to support that big software stack. You can just focus on a few models that are relevant to a, a particular uh, application and, you know, and work closely with your, your end customer to support those models. So, um, so we're uh, you know, seeing many startups jumping into this market. I've got a, a list here of some of the ones that we're tracking, um, you know, and, I, and I've highlighted ones that are, that are uh, presenting this week. Um, and we're also seeing you know, bigger established companies uh, jumping in uh, to this edge market as well. Um, you know, microcontroller vendors like NXP and Maxim are starting to put AI uh, capabilities into their, um, into their MCUs. Um, you know, other companies that are already offering uh, embedded chips of various types are, are starting to add AI capabilities as well. So, so we're seeing a lot of, a lot of um, uh, action in this market. And you know, we, we, uh, we've got a, a session later today on edge AI chips, another one on a Friday. Uh, we've got an edge AI software session on Thursday. So, um, so we'll be spending a lot of time this week, uh, you know, discussing and what's going on at the edge. Even within the edge, I mean, there are these, you know, different categories of products. Um, so, um, at the, at the lowest end, uh, we see microcontrollers that, um, you, you know, even a, a standard microcontroller CPU can handle, you know, simple neural networks. I mean, if you just want to uh, listen for a few words, uh, for example, or, or if you have a camera and you just want to tell whether um, somebody is nearby or whether there's someone in the room, um, you know, that, those kind of applications can, you know, be very simple and run on, you know, even a Cortex-M0. Um, uh, and, and, and as you get into some of the, the latest microcontrollers, you know, Cortex M55 has new uh, helium SIMD extensions. Um, so you can get into, um, you know, billions of operations uh, per second and, you know, run, run some more complicated networks. And, uh, you know, we're starting to see software tools um, available as well to target these applications. Um, but, um, but you know, if you want to do anything very uh, complicated on, on an edge uh, device, um, you really want to have some kind of AI engine, uh, not just running code on the Cortex CPU. Um, you know, the, these AI engines, of course, can offer more performance and allow you to run you know, more complicated, more interesting neural networks. 
but also uh, they can greatly improve power consumption. So if you have any kind of battery operated device, you know, that, that accelerator would be very useful. And, um, you know, and, and certainly if you want to run anything like, uh, you know, image recognition, uh, you know, even just a basic face ID function, um, you, you know, you need more performance than you can get just from a Cortex CPU. So, you know, um, you know, we're seeing several companies uh, in this space, you know, again, um, you know, companies like Brainchip, uh, we'll be hearing from Green Waves, Ambient, um, Offer, um, you know, very low power, um, low cost devices that can still run, um, you know, some of these uh, interesting functions uh, without using uh, much battery power. Um, for, for a little bit, uh, you know, higher uh, performance, higher power budget devices, uh, maybe line, line powered devices um, where you're not as, as worried about minimizing power. Um, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, bigger accelerators uh, from IP vendors um, so that uh, companies can license uh, these accelerators build their own SOCs. Um, this is particularly popular in the automotive space. Um, so, um, you know, we, uh, we've seen, you know, coming to, of course, uh, you know, the big IP vendors, ARM, Cadence, and so on, um, you know, all are all offering AI IP at this point. Um, but we're also seeing some new companies. Uh, we'll be hearing from uh, Expedera uh, today. Uh, they're, they've uh, just launched their company today and they'll be uh, presenting uh, their, their technology for the first time. Um, and uh, Edge Cortex, um, you know, will also be uh, talking today, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, on Friday, um, you know, debuting their new AI IP. And, uh, you know, so we're seeing, you know, more competition in, in the IP space. So, um, so we've got a lot of exciting things happening, as I, as I mentioned. Um, and, uh, you know, you've seen uh, this uh, uh, slide uh, before probably, um, uh, and uh, it's available on our website, but please, you know, use this as a, as a reference to, uh, uh, to uh, schedule your time this week. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got several sessions, lots of different topics um, to cover and, uh, you know, breakout sessions, as Bob mentioned, every day, um, you know, where you can interact with the speakers. So, uh, so I'm hoping uh, that, uh, you know, you'll be able to attend as much as possible and, um, you know, enjoy a lot of the good content uh, that we have uh, this week. So um, just to wrap up then, um, you know, the neural networks, you know, are getting bigger and bigger over time. And this is really driving uh, the chip industry to create uh, more powerful chips, more scalable chips, um, and uh, that they can provide the big uh, solutions that are required for these networks. Uh, as, as we're building these chips, there's a lot of opportunities to increase performance. Uh, techniques like uh, smaller data types and sparsity, you know, can, um, can offer more performance at the same power, um, but, you know, they are requiring new software, new hardware uh, to take advantage of these techniques. Um, you know, bigger changes like analog compute, optical AI um, can potentially offer, you know, you know, order of magnitude improvements in uh, performance per watt. Uh, and, and we're actually, you know, getting to the point where, uh, you know, we should in the next year see some of these uh, chips get into production and we can really uh, evaluate whether they're delivering on these promises. Um, in the data center, we're seeing uh, you know, more competition uh, for NVIDIA from, you know, from chip vendors and, and also from cloud companies building their own chips. Um, but, you know, NVIDIA is still, still the leader uh, in the data center. Um, but at the edge, it's really a free for all. Lots of uh, uh, new companies jumping in, lots of established vendors. Um, and, uh, you know, we're starting to, uh, to see that, uh, that part of the market grow and um, it should be a, a great market you know, for, uh, for some of these emerging companies. Um, and then at the very low end of the market, uh, you know, we're seeing these uh, low power chips and, and uh, IP uh, that can extend battery life. And you know, this is really going to power the internet of things in the future and enable AI uh, you know, even in very low cost uh, battery powered devices. So, um, Thank you uh, for your attention. 
uh, this morning. I do have time to take some questions. Um, we'll be uh, taking questions from the chat and um, or from the q and I'm sorry, if you use the Q&A button uh, on your screen. And, uh, and then um, uh, also uh, we'll uh, have some questions at uh, my breakout session today. Um, So, um, so I'll just uh, go ahead and take some of the uh, uh, questions from the Q and A. Um, so, question: uh, You know, what kind of trends do you see in, in network on chip uh, topology? So, um, you know, any improvement uh, there that could accelerate AI in multi-core chips? So, yeah. So, I think um, uh, you know the the network on chip uh, the NOC is important, and uh, you, you know, as I as I discussed, I mean, there is this sort of dichotomy between the small chip and the large chip philosophy and, um, or the small core and the large core philosophy. So um, for some of these uh, chips that have, you know, hundreds or thousands of cores, you know, the knock becomes very important. And certainly, um, you know, the mesh interconnect has been the, the uh, interconnect of choice, you know, for these high core count chips. Um, but even as, as you get into, you know, very large core counts, um, you know, you need to, you know, modify some of the topologies, um, you know, maybe have, uh, you know, some uh, uh, coarser grained uh, routing in, in addition to the, the neighbor to neighbor routing uh, in order to uh, handle optimal uh, uh, processing across the chip. So, so yeah, so I think, um, you know, the, the network on a chip does become more uh, important you know, as you get into some of these, you know, large AI designs. Uh, another question, uh, is there a new need for uh, new benchmarks for edge AI? Um, you know, I mean, benchmarking as a whole, I mean, it is, is evolving very rapidly. And, and I think that there's a, a need for new benchmarks uh, all the time. But, um, you know, for the edge, I think the, um, you know, the ML Perf guys, uh, ML Commons now uh, has been doing some good work. Um, and, um, you know, so I think uh, the benchmarks that, that they have are pretty good, but, you know, as we're seeing new applications and new uh, models emerging, you know, of course, we are going to need, you know, new benchmarks to track that. And, you know, hopefully those, you know, will be incorporated in, in future versions of, of the ML perf efforts. Um, question about, you know, tiny ML. Um, so yeah, I mean, we had, um, you know, at, at our last conference, uh, we had, uh, uh, you know, Google speaker talking about uh, efforts in tiny ML, Pete Warden. And, uh, you know, there's, there's definitely a lot uh, going on in the community uh, behind that. Um, a lot of, you know, software tools and, uh, you know, sharing of code that can be used, um, you know, in, in these edge AI devices. I think, you know, tiny ML is, is, is mostly aimed at, doing things on the microcontroller CPU itself, which, um, you know, as I said, is, is, is good, you know, for some things, but, um, you know, as, as the networks are getting more complicated, I think, um, you know, the emphasis is, is shifting onto, you know, using actual AI hardware accelerators rather than, you know, doing things solely on the microcontroller CPU. So, I mean, there's always gonna be a place for that, but, um, but I think, you know, the more interesting work over the next few years is gonna, involved chips with, with hardware accelerators. Um, See, so question, you know, VC funding, how's that going? <laughs> Is there too much money flying into AI chips? Yeah, you know, I'm not uh, a financial guy, but you know, it, when you look at some of the fundraising uh, rounds uh, that have been reported recently with, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, you know, going into some of these, these companies, um, you know, it, it, it is, um, you know, it, it, it's always hard to justify those valuations. Um, you know, as I said, I mean, the, uh, you, you know, the industry was growing, you know, 68% last year, um, you know, just based on NVIDIA's uh, revenue. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's clearly a multi-billion dollar industry, but, um, you know, it, it, it's hard to, um, you know, see that, that, that that growth could possibly be sustained. So, um, you know, there, 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 there's, you know, always, uh, you know, too much money flying into, you know, the, the hottest market. But I mean, uh, some of these companies are clearly, you know, going to be successful. And, you know, there is a big opportunity there. So, um, you know, I think that's why, 
why the money is, is, is coming in so quickly. Um, uh, time for a couple more questions. Um, so um, let's see, got a lot of questions here. Um, so so um, how, how does edge computing combine with edge sensing? Is it all going to be on the same silicon? Um, yeah, that, that's an interesting question. I think, um, you know, the, the, there's a lot of value in centralizing the, the AI compute. Um, you know, so if you have a system with several sensors, um, you know, that, that you, you can centralize that compute somewhere. You can then use a, a you know, a more powerful, more efficient design that, um, you know, that, that can handle the AI for all of the sensors. Um, but, um, you know, but we're seeing, you know, in, in some, you know, large systems like autonomous vehicles, I mean, there's definitely a, a value in having some pre-processing, you know, done at the camera and then feed, feed that into a central brain somewhere in the car. So, um, so I think that, um, you know, that there's, uh, you know, you know when, you're, when you're really worried about efficiency, um, you know, centralizing things makes sense, but, um, you know, for lower volume plug and play kind of platforms, um, you know, that, that putting the AI in the sensor, uh, you know, could be a good solution in that case. Um, so let's see, um, you know, specialized requirements for edge chips, um, different, different than general compute. Well, I mean, certainly, um, you know, for, for relative to, to general compute, um, you know, as I discussed, I mean, there's a lot of techniques that are being used um, both at the edge and the data center uh, to improve efficiency on AI models. Now, I mean, for edge chips in particular, um, you know, the emphasis tends to be on uh, power efficiency, on cost, and, um, you know, uh, and on latency in many cases. So, um, so, you know, that may be a little bit different than, you know, in the data center where it's, you know, more focused on performance and performance per watt. So, um, so yeah, there, there, there's definitely, you know, different requirements there. I mean, the other big challenge, you know, for these edge devices is that typically, um, you know, they want to integrate the AI into uh, the main SOC. Um, and um, so you really want to build a, a complete SOC, you know, for uh, an IoT device, for example, um, you know, for a smart speaker, um, you know, so, uh, or, or some other device. And so you have to have the expertise in order to, 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 to build that entire SOC and not just the AI component. So, um, so yeah, the, so there's definite um, uh, specialization going on and, and within the edge market, I mean, you'll have different chips for a smartphone versus a smart speaker, um, you know, versus a, a, a doorbell camera. So, um, so it, I think there's room within the edge market for, you know, uh, many vendors to succeed for, you know, different vendors to succeed in different markets, um, you know, depending on which ones, you know, can meet these specialized requirements. So, um, you know, we're out of time um, uh, for now and, you um, you know, so as I said, uh, we will, uh, I will be speaking at, at a breakout session uh, today um, at um, 1140 Pacific time and um, happy to answer uh, more of your questions then. So hopefully you can come by. And in the meantime, uh, we will be uh, taking a 10 minute break. And uh, when we come back from the break, uh, we'll be uh, having a session on uh, Edge AI. So I uh, hope you can uh, stay for that. Thanks.